In the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who has ears, let him hear. In the name of our living and ascended Lord and King, Jesus Christ, I stand before you with his message this morning. It was the second day of fifth grade and Miss O'Callaghan pulled a fast one on us. Pop quiz, books away, notes away, and I just want you to know you can expect a pop quiz for the rest of the semester without warning. Did you have a Miss O'Callaghan who gave you pop quizzes in grade school? And if so, did it teach you how to prepare for her class? I'll bet it did. The disciples are pressing Jesus for the when of that great day of deliverance, but Jesus answers with only two different replies. He says, soon, and he says, you do not know the day or the hour. Our Lord God, in his wisdom, has seen fit not to reveal to us the when of that last great day. We can't circle it on a calendar. We can't set our iCal on our smartphone to 9.17 a.m., 384 Saturdays ahead. No. And knowing that, how does that change your preparation while you wait here in time, in this time between today and the day of triumph? What if you could circle the day of Jesus coming on your calendar? What if you could set an alarm on your calendar for Christ's arrival day? How would it affect your worship? Would you still worship? I mean, if you knew the day that you were going to die, and you can pretty well figure out generally it's about 70-ish for men, but you knew the time when Jesus was going to return, how would it affect your worship? Would we still bring babies, infants, so early to be baptized? Would we still conduct a Sunday school, or would we still run our 7th and 8th graders through confirmation class? Would we even continue to have this discussion about being a lifelong learner of the word? And would we even offer Bible classes? I hope your answer to all of these would be yes, 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 and yes, if, if we had this to face this. But in this theoretical situation, you can see the temptation, can't you? If you knew when Jesus was going to return. Our church life would spiral downhill into nothing more than a getting yourself ready for Christ class before the last two years of your life. You would be urgently thinking to yourself, I need to make sure that I get it right before my time is up. Would your faith, if you knew when Jesus was returning, would your faith truly celebrate the love of your Savior? Or would Jesus turn into nothing more than a quick, easy ticket to cheat death and hell. Jesus' greatest desire for you is that his coming back is going to be not a day of terror for you, but a day of triumph in him. Today, in the parable of the ten virgins, Jesus, from one aspect, answers the question, what are we saints supposed to be doing with ourselves as we're hanging out here in this time of today and the time in between today and the day of triumph? In this parable of the ten virgins, Jesus basically says, don't let your guard down while you're waiting for me to come. Don't let your faith slip away. Don't lose out on the promise of me. Keep watching. Keep watching for the midnight bridegroom. Jesus' message before us in this parable this morning is really pretty simple, straightforward, and clear. We do not know when he is going to return. Therefore, stay alert, stay awake, stay prepared, feed your faith, stay in the word, keep watching. 
That's the whole point. He uses this picture setting of a Jewish wedding procession. And this is pretty much how it went. But regarding the virgins or the bridesmaids, in our case, he says, the foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. There's a lot of attention paid to the oil in this, in this parable. I don't know if you noticed it. And here's why. You see, under normal circumstances, the oil that would be in their lamps, and they probably were most certainly lamps, not torches, because torches you'd have to douse with more oil every 15 minutes. Under normal circumstances, the lamps would have enough oil to give off a flame into, oh, you know, early evening, a little bit past dusk, when the normal average Joe bridegroom would normally appear now for the festivity of reuniting with his bride that he had been married to probably months if not even a year before. But the big difference here is, that makes the big difference is the amount of oil that was required because we're told the bridegroom was a long time in coming. You see, what makes five of these virgins truly foolish is not the fact that they didn't have extra oil. It's because of the why they didn't have extra oil. They assumed they knew the when of the bridegroom's arrival. And so many of us have that same attitude in our lives. Young people get confirmed and they think they've graduated from Bible study and they say to themselves, I've got my whole life ahead of me to be able to spend time learning the Bible better. But do you really? Back in 2008, I ministered to a young man whose name was Kyle Schober. And he died from prostate cancer. And he was buried at the age of 14. Do you really have your whole life ahead of you? Do you really know the when of your last great day? Even those in the prime of our lives, we think, well, I'm healthy, things are going well. You know, um, what, what could possibly happen? I've got plenty of time to be able to dig into the Word and, and learn more about the Bible and attend those religious geek classes that Pastor Thompson and Getzinger run on Sunday morning before, before church. Except, do you remember Sue Kadu? She's in the prime of her life. All she was looking forward to was watching her children grow up, maybe get married, and have the gift of grandchildren. And she had to shift her priorities to not meeting grandchildren, but meeting her savior 40 years prematurely according to the normal lifespan because she died of cancer. Pastor Thompson presided over her funeral. Sadly, I was out of town. Well, you make it all the way to retirement and maybe now you have some time for Bible class and you think to yourself, yeah, now I have time, some few years, maybe, maybe 7 to 10, maybe 12 years, 20 if I'm blessed, to maybe study the Bible more and uh, to be able to spend some time with my spouse and maybe do a little bit of traveling. Except, do you remember Earl Gaddy? I buried Earl Gaddy within two years of his retirement. Do you really have all that time? Do you really know the when of your own personal last great day? Well, only the wise virgins were ready and prepared for the coming of a groom at any time and any hour. And just like that, Jesus snaps himself out of this parable and he eyeballs you, eyeball to eyeball, and he applies the point of his parable. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or hour. Jesus commands us, and it is a command in the Greek. He commands us to keep watch because he understands full well that there are way too many of us who consider ourselves to be Christians or are extremely weak in our faith 
who will say, Lord, Lord, on their last great day, and he knows that they are not going to be entering into the kingdom of heaven. Hear this. Just because you know that Jesus is going to return does not guarantee that you are prepared to meet him. How does the scripture put it again? Oh, yes. Some honor him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. Some think that they are standing firm, but they are not careful about a fall. Jesus warns us because he loves us. Keep watch. Well, what is the big problem in all of this? What's the underlying root cause? The big problem is your greatest enemy is the big problem. And your greatest enemy? It's you. You can't trust yourself. So what happens when a lie is spoken often enough? It becomes truth, right? How many lies do you have rolling around and rattling around in your own thoughts? Like, you doubt your own forgiveness because this time you have really done a woozy, big time sin and you're doubting whether you're really forgiven and what your Father in Heaven really has to say about it as if you forgot what the Son of God did on that dark Friday afternoon. Because the lies are swirling around. They replace the truth. How many lies do you have daily, do you hear, swirling around in the world? And then a Christian that at one time been strong has fallen away, or a weak Christian falls away even easier, and their belief, their faith is gone. And then after some time, they feel an emptiness, a void in them, and so they start looking around for something to fill it with, and rather than returning to the source of life, they turn to some false religion, thinking that this will be new and exciting and it will fill them. Or maybe not all that complicated that I just mentioned to you. Maybe it's just as simple as you simply just tolerate the wickedness that is inside of you. Let's return to the picture of the parable for a moment, can we? I want you to imagine that your heart is like a lamp. Dry, empty, dark, dead lamp. And Jesus pours into the depths of this wretched darkness the oil of his own blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins so that by his death you would have life. What kind of heart lamp is this that we have? It's a defective one. Because with a sinful nature, this heart lamp of mine and this heart lamp of yours has a hole in the bottom. More oil is going to be needed. And I can hear that I am forgiven of my sin, and I can believe it, and I can trust it, and I cannot doubt it, but ask me again in a week, or in a month, or in a year when my circumstances have changed and I'm being vexed and flayed by something new going on in my life, ask me then, no, folks, I need to remember the promises of my Savior so that it is not replaced by a lie. I need to return to my source of life, my word of God. We have holes in our hearts and they need to be filled up continually. We need the Word of God that is greater than our hearts. The ongoing training, rebuking, correcting, and encouraging that only God's Word can fill 
It is the only oil that we need, and we find it in him. The only safe place for you and for me is to keep ourselves parked beneath the oil spout of the oil jar. I'm going to harp on it again. No, let's rephrase that. I'm going to encourage you again in the context of this gospel lesson. Personal family devotions. I preach that to myself. I'm guilty of it as well. Personal Bible study. I preach that to myself. I'm guilty of letting it be intermittent as well. Formal Bible class together here at St. Paul. We just heard this morning, you can never know the basics too thoroughly. Or like Luther said, don't let mildew grow on your basics. Regular family worship together where we hear the word of God together and we are fed with his supper for the strengthening of our faith in Jesus as our Savior. These all have value. They all have value. Not because of some outward activity that we're going through, but because they're the oil of God that flows from his hand through his word. Mercifully, abundantly, overwhelmingly, he repeatedly gives and gives and gives to us. He reveals to us in his word his plan to save us. He points us to the lamb of sacrifice. He heals the sin-sick soul. He calms the troubled heart. He takes the poor in spirit and lifts them up and says, you are rich in me. He makes the dead alive through the word of peace. Meaning that unwatchfulness is going to be a mini drought of God's saving word in your lamp. And what happens if that drought continues? How many empty lies are going to fill the space of God's oil in your lamp? You're going to knock at the door. The groom is going to answer. He's going to look at you eyeball to eyeball. And he's going to say, I don't know you. Jesus warns us in this parable because we know that we are weak. He knows that we are weak. And then it's very possible for us to fall away. The Bible does not teach a once saved, always saved. That's the whole point of his parable this morning. Stay awake. Stay alert. Stay in my word. Keep yourself alive. Jesus tells us this morning, on the one hand, that we can't trust ourselves. On the other hand, keep knocking. No, Jesus is not confused. He's not talking out of both sides of his mouth. And no, that does not mean that we can save ourselves by our own alertness because our faith is not based on the fact of keeping ourselves ready and aware and alert. No, instead, what Jesus does our bridegroom does is he empties our lamp of any and all sense of self-confidence that we can save ourselves and then he comes in and he refills our lamp with the comfort that in him all oil is found because in Jesus there is more than a sufficient supply of this oil by his perfect life he offered you to God a life he offered for you to God a life that lacked absolutely nothing in its perfection. He left absolutely no sin unpaid that needed to be paid to make you righteous in his Father's sight. And under the faucet of his works, we are saved. And it is that that keeps you prepared and motivates you to be prepared. What a shepherd we have. What a shepherd for our souls. Looking forward to spending eternity with him. A bridegroom, a bridegroom that wants nothing more 
and to usher you inside the banquet door. And someday, one day, he is going to come and he's going to deliver us once and for all from ourselves and from everything else that tries to harm us. When that day comes, it's going to be a glorious day. On that day, these lamps of ours, these lamps are going to be snuffed out and they're going to be left behind. No more need for oil. No more need for watching. Because our bridegroom, the Lord Jesus himself, is going to be our light forever and ever and ever. That's God's message for you today, saint of the Lord. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, it will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.